All right, so it is 10 a.m. We'll go ahead and get started just to make sure we'll be on time. We'll let other people come on in as they do so, but for now, welcome. Uh, my name is Sarah Deldine. I'm the Exhibitions Manager here at Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara. Thank you so much for joining us for the artist talk that we have today titled Virtual Residency in Contemporary Craft. This talk will be led by Sydney Pace, who is one of the Emerging Leaders in the Arts Fellows, as you can see below. She's joining me on our spotlight. Just a quick little note, Emerging Leaders in the Arts is a program that we have here at Museum of Contemporary Arts Santa Barbara. We've had this program since 2018. This is the third year of the program. And this program is a nine month long to a year long, depending on uh, the year. COVID has changed us a little bit. But um, it is an extensive program that invites uh, underrepresented artists specifically related to race within the museum to um, take on curatorial training, professional development training, meet with higher level museum um, members such as curators and uh, other levels of staff uh, just to in integrate different people into this museum sphere and also help understand and um, create a pipeline for uh, museum leadership. Sydney Pace is one of three fellows that we have this year. I have had the pleasure of meeting with her since January. She's a really incredible human being and she'll be speaking today with a couple of artists that she has been working with for an independent curatorial project through the course of her time with ELA. But, uh, I would love to introduce her. I'll go ahead and turn my video off, but essentially she's going to be introducing her project and soon her artists. Sespi and Becca, and I would love for you all to meet them as well. But thank you so much for joining us. And Sydney, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah, for the intro. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sydney, uh, Sydney Pace. I'm a senior at UCSB, majoring in fine art. Um, as Sarah said, I'm uh, this year's ELA fellow, and um, through this fellowship, I was granted the opportunity to uh, develop and, and fund a community project um, thanks to MCASB. Um, for my project, I chose to create a five week long virtual artist residency that centered around contemporary craft. And um, um, yeah, this, this residency allowed the space for um, emerging artists to create, um, collaborate and foster community through a virtual connection. And I really felt that there was a need, um, a need for artists to be granted both the time and funding um, to explore and experiment um, within their medium. And, um, yeah, this was needed to develop their craft and um, their conceptual ideas. And the artists that I invited to participate in this residency are Sespi Miller and Becca Vasquez. And um, yeah, these are two incredible emerging artists and they were both so dedicated to their projects during our time together. And yeah, I'm excited to have them share um, their work with you all today. So, okay. So our first artist is gonna be Becca Vasquez and Becca is a Chicano weaver and jewelry fiber artist residing in El Paso, Texas. Her current work focuses primarily on handwoven earrings. Um, her practice is deeply rooted in intense experimentation. Oops, I am so sorry about that. Um, specifically regarding her materials that she uses to weave her textiles. She uses natural fibers and dyes and the patterns that she incorporates into her pieces are inspired by the landscapes that surround her. So I am gonna go ahead and share my screen and Becca is gonna present her awesome project. Okay, hold on, let's see. Hi everyone. Perfect. Hi everyone. 
Um, so I'm gonna just briefly talk about how I got into weaving and then I'll show the two types of earrings that I sell and then I'll get to what I made during the art residency. Um, so I started weaving about three, four years ago and uh, the loom on the right, that's my first loom, my first wooden loom. And I also, when I started weaving, I used a lot of thrifted yarn because I wasn't sure. Um, I was very, really new to it. I didn't know how to weave. I didn't know anybody that wove. So I started off with um, minimal material. I ended up making tons and tons of these mini tapestries. And I had made earrings before using seeds and seed pods. So I had a lot of the ear wire, the jump rings, and a lot of the earring making tools. So I ended up making these mini tapestries into earrings. So the one on the left with the red and the brown and the silver clamp, that was the first um, style of earrings that I made and sold. And I sold those to my friends and then my friends of friends and then my family members. And then I started posting them on Instagram and I started just kind of making a small mini business out of it. Um, and for about a year, I worked at a warehouse. And then after I would come home um, at the end of my work shift, I would sell these earrings and then I slowly got better. Um, next slide. So the earrings on the left, the ones that I'm wearing that are pink and black, those are the style of earrings that I started weaving a few months before the pandemic started in March. And um, during the height of the pandemic and during all of 2020, that was my main income was making earrings. So I would spend hours every day making earrings and I got a lot of practice. Um, and then I ended up being able to make different like designs in the earring. So the three that are on the left are the ones that I've woven in the last two to three months. And um, last year when I was selling these earrings, a lot of people were asking me if I had smaller earrings. Um, and I also wanted to change it up, make something different, but still have weaving involved. So I purchased an ankle loom, which is used to make belts, or um, it's used for a lot of things. Belt making, you can use uh, purse handles, making purse handles, shoelaces. So I got the ankle loom and I was like, well, I, I can make a different form out of it. So I ended up making a hoop style earring. So next slide. So the ankle loom is different than the first loom that I started off with the, on the first slide when I showed you the small tapestry loom. Um, and I didn't mention the last, on the last slide, when I started making the longer earrings, um, I did end up getting a, a taller loom, but it was still a loom that I could carry with me so I can sit on the couch and make one earring at a time. And that's how I still do it today. But with these, the ankle loom, um, it's warp basing. So when you put the warp yarn that holds everything together, that's the thread that's gonna show rather than the weft. Um, so the picture on the left is me wearing some earrings that I made with the ink loom using wool that is uh, more softer and doesn't fringe as much as the ones that I did with in the last slide. And these are way smaller. And then I was thinking, well, like I said earlier, I was, I was gonna end up doing the hoop shape, which you can kind of see in the middle picture. But when I started making the hoop shape, after a while, the two sides just kind of stick together. And I wanted to keep that shape. So I thought, I thought about, you know, what can I do to fill it and make that shape stay. 
Um, and so I had saved a lot of milkweed seed pods um, that I had made earrings with a long time ago. And I had saved the milkweed fluff that the milkweed seeds are attached to. And those are like a natural insulator. And uh, people used to put them in pillows as like, a, you know, the pillow filling and people used to put them in gloves for insulation. And I wanted to eventually make my own gloves, but I had all this, like this bag full of milkweed fluff. So I decided to use the ink loom and make these hoop earrings, but then uh, fill them with the milkweed fluff. And next slide. So this is the third type of earring that I've been trying to make. Um, you can see the milkweed fluff inside the um, woven band that I made with the ink loom. And then I decided to, in order to keep the milkweed fluff in there, I decided to get some embroidery cloth and needle punch into the embroidery cloth and then hand sew it all together. And this is what I, I've been wanting to do this for a really long time, but it takes a long time and it uses skills that I don't know that I have to practice. Like I don't really, I'm not that great of a hand weaver or no, I'm not that great of a hand sewer and needle punching and using embroidery cloth. So um, it's taken a lot of practice. So these are the first ones that I made before the art residency. And then um, the ones that I'll show after this slide are the ones that I made during the residency. Next slide. So um, for the pillow earrings, I'm calling them, I don't have an official name for them yet, but I used um, yarn that I hand dyed with black walnut. And then the picture to the left, the top left is the ankle loom. And so I warped it so I can make the band, which is pictured on the bottom left with some indigo. And the indigo, I'll end up um, using that as needle punch thread, but that's what the band ends up looking like, a, a, simple, a simple band with the ink loom. Next slide. And this is another style band that I made as practice. And this actually shows the hoop earrings that I'm wearing right now. What I do is, so I'll weave them on the ink loom and then I'll use a sewing machine. I'll measure them out and then I'll use a sewing machine, glue them and then clamp them. But with the pillow filling, filling earrings, um, I leave a little bit at the end, sew it, and then I'll flip it inside out to keep that circle shape. Next slide. And then this is me needle punching into the embroidery cloth and I'm using a type of yarn that's a combination of so many different things. I can't remember what everything is in it, but it's very soft. It does have milkweed silk in it. So it's really smooth and then it puffs up when it goes to the other side. I didn't have any experience needle punching before this. So I was learning how to make it a solid piece, um, how to get a rhythm. There's a certain angle that I was learning makes it faster and I don't get so much resistance out of the cloth. And then I used um, a plastic embroidery hoop and then a wooden one and both of those kept caving in, I think because of the force of the pin um, going into the cloth. So I have to learn like, okay, what do I buy um, to keep that from happening? Um, it did take several times to get this figured out. And another thing with this is trying to measure out the circle because um, sometimes I ended up getting it too small and then the shape of the earring would cave in a little bit or it would bow out. Um, but that's my experience with the, the needle punching. All right, next slide. 
So these are bringing it all together. So I have the band that I made with the ink loom, the black walnut, um, brown yarn, and then the needle punch into the embroidery cloth. I ended up gluing the side, the back side of it because I had to start a bunch of times because a lot of times the yarn would get stuck. So I ended up gluing it just to make sure that it wouldn't unravel. And then it's, this is kind of showing how I sew everything together. The inside this time around, I used cotton, natural brown cotton. And um, I also took some silk linen, black silk linen thread, and I put it through the top of the earring so that I could hoop around the jump ring. And that's what I'm going to attach the ear wire to. And I wanna experiment more about this because I'm not sure over time the wear and tear of it. The very first ones that I made, I put it right into the woven band but a friend of mine told me, okay, over time, that's going to like sag and it might even rip. So this is me with the black thread trying to figure out another way to attach the, the metal jump ring. Um, so I still got to figure out what I'm going to do with that. Next slide. And this is another version that I made. Um, this one is stuffed with thistle down. Um, so thistle down is like a thistle fluff similar to milkweed where the seeds are attached to the fluff and then um, in the fall when the seeds disperse, they disperse through wind. Um, so then here's kind of a good example of I made the embroidery circle way too big. And then I, so on the, on the right, you can kind of see it caving in a little bit. So when I sewed it all together, it kind of caved in on the side. I'm still learning um, how to sew these like little, these little circles. And um, so I definitely need practice with that. But um, this is just another, another look at the breakdown of the earring. All right, next slide. So this is a double one. Um, I attached the two, these two pillow earrings with um, the black silk linen yarn that I used to attach the jump ring to as well. Um, these earrings I ended up, uh, I guess the jump ring that I, or the ear wire that I used for them, they ended up making them really heavy. So it's another challenge to figure out. They're really light, but adding that metal to it can definitely make it um, not so light. So I'm trying to figure out if I do end up making these double pillow earrings, what will the ear wire end up being? Next slide. Um, these are another ones that I, another pair that I made. Uh, I did show kind of the indigo yarn and then the black walnut dyed brown um, band that I wove. And then the pink in this one is uh, cochineal, which is cochineal. And that material was a thin cotton and I had a hard, hard time uh, needle punching with the, with the cotton. I had a easier time with the um, the milkweed silk cut or the milkweed silk uh, wool mix than I did with the cotton. So I learned that I'm not going to use the the thin threaded cotton for the needle punching. But these came out. These were probably one of the best ones that came out because I did well with the sewing. And then I sent them to a friend, and um, she's wearing them and likes them. And they're really lightweight and comfortable to wear. Next slide. So these are um, some of them together. My very first one's on the left with the bright yellow. 
and then some other ones I made. Um, I did make a lot because of, I think the, the challenge I have the most is just the sewing, like just making sure that I keep the shape while I'm sewing around the band. Um, oh yeah. Actually, and I would say the needle punch, but the sewing I think is the hardest. Next slide. So this is my last slide and I wanted to make it last because it shows the grana coxinia, which is the coxino from the nopal plant, the prickly pear. And my goal with this earring was eventually I wanna make the earrings with wool that's dyed from plants that are regional to the, that are from this area, like, like the cochineal or the wild cochineal or the pomegranate. Um, other ones would be the, trying to think of other plants that are here, like the pecan, there's a lot of pecan farms. So my goal would be to dye the wool with dyes that I find here in the El Paso Chihuahuan Desert, and then also use um, insulation that's also found here, like thistle, um, maybe cottonwood fluff, um, milkweed fluff. And also, I do get most of my wool from New Mexico, uh, uh, central New Mexico and northern New Mexico, but um, it's still, even though I live in El Paso and it's Texas, like um, El Paso is right next to New Mexico. It's right next to Mexico. So in a sense, it's still in this area. I would maybe like to find um, someone who has wool that I can spin maybe from somewhere closer like Las Cruces or maybe Juarez or something that I can use. But I am so, so thankful for Sydney for reaching out to me. Um, this takes a lot of time experimenting and also I rely on um, my earring sales. It's like my main income. So sometimes experimenting on projects does take time um, to do. And I'm so grateful for her reaching out. This is my first art residency. This is my first time presenting about this. So the experience was a really, really good one. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's the end. Thank you so much, Becca. Oh my gosh. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, let me see. Oh, uh oh. I'm clicking things. Hold on. Okay. So. Um, that was amazing, Becca. Thank you. So our, our next artist is Sespi Miller. And um, Sespi is a basket weaver who currently resides in Santa Barbara, California. Their work centers um, around basketry, specifically using willow. Um, as part of their weaving process, Sespi cultivates and tends to willow throughout this territory. Their intimate relationship with this plant embodies a beautiful spiritual element within their artistic practice. Um, Sespi wove their first basket 11 years ago and has been prolific in their work since then. So yeah, Sespi, whenever you're ready, go for it. Hello, everybody. Um... And okay, hello everybody. Let's see. Okay, um, gosh, okay, hi. Um, so I wanna say that um, 
I weave here on um, unceded Chumash land and um, yeah, I've been weaving baskets like Sydney said for 11 years. And um, I also wanna say thank you so much for Sydney, for all the work you've put in to, to this and all your, your free time and your labor. Um, and your care, your sweet care. And wanna also say thank you to the ELA team. Um, this, yeah, it's been really special to have time carved out to, uh, to focus on something I've never focused on and kind of step into a new project. Um, yeah, so I'm, um, I'm a guest here on Chumash land and my ancestry is uh, Irish and, and Scottish and, um, and there there's these fishing krills that are made out of willow. Um, and this year I've been really courting the ocean. I've been going out in a kayak and fishing for the first time ever to, yeah, to just kind of shorten my, um, my, uh, just to, to like, to bring those cycles of food closer to my, my plate and from the ocean rather than buying them from the store. And just going out in a little kayak with a little jig and floating around and um, kept having this feeling of like, ah, oh, one day I really wanna make one of these fishing krills. Um, and they're um, primarily made out of willow. Uh, there was a time like not too long ago, like I just learned that my, my grandfather actually had one of these fishing krills, but um, you know, it's store bought and kind of generically made and um, every, no, no machine can make a basket. So every basket that's in the thrift store, any basket that's like, um, yeah, that, that you buy some hand made that. Um, and so these are carried when you go out fishing and you can keep like your knife in there or some of your fishing gear or your bait. And the special thing about this basket is that there is a flat edge that can sit against your back or your shoulder or um, your hip. And there's a lid with a clasp that has this little hole um, and that hole is used for when you catch your fish, you don't have to open your basket and you can just slip your fish inside. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about willow. Um, of course, there would be no basket, willow basket without willow. And shout out to the folks who know how important beavers are um, to Turtle Island and to around the world and to the willow plant. Um, beavers, so willow loves disturbance. Willow grows where there's water and where there's water, there's often floods, um, there's often beaver. Um, there's also fire everywhere. Um, the landscape as we know loves to be kissed by fire and craves that and misses that. Um, and so willow really responds beautifully when there's um, beaver teeth teeth crunching on it or um, yeah, floods coming through and crashing it down. Um, so, so that's kind of what, um, when you go out harvesting for willow, that's kind of what you're recreating is the teeth of the beaver through the, through the clippers. Um, and when you harvest willow or cut willow back or when there's a flood, um, willow responds with these long whips. So here on the left side, you can see a photo of um, winter solstice. This was on winter solstice on a little backpacking trip. And this was a trail that was used for a fire um, fire access and the fire crew cut down the willow that was closest to the trail and you can see how the willow responded 
it came back in these really long, beautiful, delicious, buttery shoots that are straight. And then you can see the, um, the willow on the left side where it wasn't cut. And you can see um, how that plant is very branchy and um, each. So the willow that was cut, that's a year's worth of growth. So that's from springtime into winter or half a year's of growth or three, three quarters of a year. And then each year um, that there's growth, the plant gets branchier and branchier and branchier. And that creates uh, a lot more dead growth, which um, dead debris, which is like hanging in the air. Um, it creates a hotter fire when it burns. It also um, is, makes the plant more um, receptacle to different diseases. Um, and so really basket weaving and um, basket weaving and harvesting willow is beneficial to these species. Um, to the right, this is a picture of um, springtime when the creeks are flowing and there's um, the yellow um, bush, bush yarrow, it's not a true yarrow, growing, flowering in the hillsides. And there's this uh, narrow leaf willow that's growing on the side of the creek who's, who is putting out their spring, spring life and starting to make whips. And this also is a cool photo because it was actually like maybe two years before fire. You can see the oak tree on the top that got hit by a hot, hot fire and it's slowly coming back. There's still dead branches hanging. And on the left, there's a sea and notice that burned um, that there's, it's slowly coming back too, but there's tons of dead life. And then you see the willow and the willow is just thriving. Um, so some of, my, some of my materials I harvest from the land, some of the materials um, I also just grow next to my house and um, just, this is the narrow leaf. This is my favorite basket willow. Um, and um, I just uh, planted two varieties of European species in my gray water. And that's a huge gift if you can possibly break your pipes and have your water flood your backyard, then you should do that and you should plant willow or food or any medicine you want. And um, these times of droughts are crazy. And uh, yeah, willow is like a really, really important plant to grow. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about baskets and how um, it's an art form it's a tradition and it's also like, what I love about it is these are beings that are um, based off of utility and beauty and the combination of being able to go out and use the things you are creating on the land. Um, that to me just has always inspired me through art school. I felt kind of like, yeah, I love art so much. It's really important, um, but I just find the making of something um, even like, yeah, even more making something that you can use um, on the landscape, really important or in your home. Because um, we buy so much random stuff that we don't know where it comes from so much, you know. Um, I wanted to talk about, uh, yeah, river ecology just for one second. Um, I wanted to say that willow has a rooting hormone um, that gardeners use for propagating fruit trees or cut plants from cuttings like figs or mulberries. Um, and like I was saying, Willow loves flooding and also beaver chews. And so when the beavers are chewing on the willow bark um, or taking trees down, these living trees, and a flood comes through, then the, all this willow debris is floating through these waterways, through the watershed. 
and actually putting making the the river kind of into this like willow tea that has this rooting hormone and so when there's other plants floating down uh through a flood like a piece of elderberry or um or poplar or cottonwood then they are getting hit with this this hormone that's helping them sprout their roots um, and then they wash up on a bank and then you have an elder tree growing so yeah being a basket weaver is good we should all look, we should all be basket weavers um <laughs> Okay, and then what else did I want to say? I also want to say that, yeah, like like the rooting hormone, like when you take the the willow and you cut it and you just stick it in some wet water or some mud, then it sprouts. And that's something that when you're weaving, um, when you're harvesting or out with the plants, you can just cut a piece of willow and put it into a mud bank and that will help stabilize the bank and create more willow um so we bundle this is on a camping trip we bundle i bundle the um the willow into length because that's how we soak it um okay yes tending spots or like spots that you harvest um you have to be really careful and be really diligent and aware when you go into spaces because there are a lot of places where people harvest um, basket material out there in the the wild or on side of roads and it's quite disrespectful to harvest from places where other people are tending um, and i've totally found many people's basket gardens, uh, which is really incredible when you start to train the eye to see like cut marks or um, yeah, different different ways of cultivating basket material. Um, but that is something to be very aware of when you're walking the land, looking to um, harvest or tend any plants. Yeah, make sure you know the community around who are doing that, mostly indigenous folks, you know, get the right of way, of course, and um, yeah, should just be on your radar. So, so here's the willow I soaked for this project. So um, here is a royal willow, here's the narrow leaf willow, and here is the cultivated European willow. And my teacher says a foot a day. So you take you take your basket material and you soak it in cold water. Um, and depending on how cold the water is, it can take like up to, it can take up to a week or more. And I really love putting it in some, some in the creek. Um, so after that, after about uh, a week of soaking the willow, I with the willow and I wrapped it into a wet towel and this is called mellowing. And mellowing is, um, yeah, you take, a, you take your, your willow and uh, it comes out of the creek and it's full of water. And um, if you like pick a cucumber from your garden and you uh, take a bite of it, it's really crispy and full of liquid, right? But then if you leave one of them like on your counter in your house um, and um, leave it in the sun, leave it out for a couple of days and then you pick it up, it's all wobbly. And that's like the moisture leaving and it creates this beautiful buttery texture in the material. So, here are the bases. I had never made these bases before. These are called tension trays. Um, and with this project, I was really like, I really wanted to try things I had never done before and take this opportunity to, to grow my own skills. Um, so this is the foundation of the basket. And then from the foundation, you add uprights. So these are the rods 
that are the uprights. You just kind of plug them in onto the side and then weave them in to the ends. And then, um, and then the uprights, you prick them up and you tie them up and you make yourself some hot cocoa. And then you start the, the three strand whale. That's the, uh, the glue to the basket. Um, this is like the, ba the way the basket really, it's like what structurally holds the basket. And it's really good for when you join pieces together. So it's this pattern right here. It's over two and behind one on the left side of the left photo on the left. Um, and then you start the, the rand, which this is a French rand. And the rand is a way, it's not really structural, it's more, that's like what the three strand whaling is, it's a structural piece. The rand is more to just build up and make some space, like to, to create space um, quickly. And so you put them all in place and then you have this beautiful like octopus basket situation that feels really chaotic and um, you have, uh, rods coming out of each window. And here on the left, you can see I, I put this photo in because I just wanted to share it, share like what it looks like from this angle. It sticks kind of coming out from everywhere. It's this really beautiful thing. Um, and then on the, on the right, there is the, um, the basket. I don't know if I'm there's the basket that is, that is, has um, a three strand whale, a rand, a three strand whale, a rand, and then a three strand whale. And then all the spokes sticking up. Um, and that is the next step, which is then turning them into a braid on the top for the rim. And this was a rim I had never done before. I tried to count it earlier looking at these photos. I was like, because there's, I, yeah, I, I need to learn the names of the, all the different braids, but this is like, a, I don't know. I feel like it's like a four or a five rod braid, but, but I can't really tell. <laughs> I'd have to sit down and do it again. So this is the, i would made two fishing krills. I don't know if I said that, but I made two fishing krills. I made one um, that I wanted to, I really wanted to make a second one to really um, see the improvements in myself. And um, so this was my second one. And you can see on the bottom there's, this is the Arroyo Willow, this nice brown. Then the three strand whale, that's the sandbar, that beautiful orange. And then this was actually some, um, some dogwood here, which is really, really special. Um, and this dogwood is, it, it's um, originally red and then soaked, dried and soaked. This one turned, turned pretty green. Um, but me and my friends, we kind of call this the cool kid weave. And I don't know the actual traditional name of it, but it's just like the people who are like really amazing basket weavers, they make their baskets with this weave quite a bit because it is so beautiful. And this was my first time ever trying this weave out and I was really excited. Um, and it's kind of makes this beautiful ladder pattern. So if you follow it, it goes like from one, upright and it switches back upon itself. It's just such a beautiful pattern, I, I feel like. And here, here's the second one finished without the lid, the lids are coming. Um, and I did the same, I did the same uh, braid on the top of that one. So here's the creation of the lid. On the left side of um, 
you can see it's one single willow rod that's carved to make a full 90 degree angle. And then on the, the right side, you can see I carved out the belly so they can marry each other, they can sit together. I started the weaving, it's like a under over under over pattern with, with these ribs. Then I continued the weaving on the left side and I added more ribs and it becomes more and more full and you can use different willow that has different colorations to create some um, eye pleasure. Um, and then on the left, here it is, finished lid with a blast of orange in the middle. Um, and then this one was like a, a lid I had never done before. Um, it's, it's got a window coming in over here and um, these ribs going all the way across. And to, um, yeah, to, to kind of get these to be in their spot was really tricky. It's all them, it's them holding down tension um, upon themselves, holding themselves in place. And so like this one, this far, this one here is, is going under and this one's holding it and then going over and then this one's holding it. And so it's this like linked up willow chain and then I tied it with a string. And to make the window, I had to, I made two of these actually. This is my second one, my more improved one where I had used for where the window goes, I used two sticks that go across. And um, then over on the right side, you can see there's, there's the stick that um, is holding space for the window and it's woven into the weaving, um, which is just, yeah. keeping it a little crisp, crisper. And then, so here's the finished lid for the first krill I did. And here are the uh, fishing curls, nearly finished. Um, I added some bark tan goat hide here and um, made a slit, made a little willow ring that's twined willow that's tied into the belly of the basket. And then a piece of, um, a piece of willow that's carved to go slide through the hoop to secure the clasp. Um, and yeah, there, I was noticing that there's some that are traditional clasp. There's some really cool traditional clasp where the willow ring is actually up here on the top of the lid and you take the, you, and there's no leather at all. You just, you just, you, there's a hole in the lid for the willow ring to stick out and then you put a, a piece of wood through it. And I'd like to try that in the future. And then this one, I just kind of, I just went for it. There they are with their lids open. I have not used them yet. Um, I really want to take them out fishing and I have been kind of too busy to go fishing lately. Um, but I'm excited for some photos when there's a fish in them. Um, so then here's, so I kind of, I put a, I put a, um, I put a uh, strap on the one that I, I like the most um, that I thought I'd use, want to use. I definitely want to use both of them, but um, I put a strap on this one here. Um, I just really love the shape of it a lot. Even though it does not have the hole, I still feel like it's very functional. Of course. Here's the last photo of the slide. Here is the finished product of um, my, my month long internship or yeah. Um, self self ran internship supported by this program and i'm just 
yeah, thanks everyone for watching and listening and um, I appreciate you all so much. And Thank you, Sespi. All right, thank you so much everybody for um, joining us and listening to these amazing artists share about their projects and their work. Um, like I said, we're gonna be doing a, a Q and A. If you have any questions, um, please just type them into the chat and then I can I can ask the artists the questions that you that you'd like to know the answers to. Um, so far we don't have any questions, but um, I'll just ask you both. Oh, never mind. Let's see. Okay, question for both of you. When are you both going to collaborate on a weaving workshop together? <laughs> I'm not sure about the workshop, but I was definitely thinking we should do a trade of a basket for a beautiful woven strap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same thing too. <laughs> also from Mero asks, um, what are you both most excited about in your next creations? Next creations, like as in a new project, maybe. Um, I got a bigger loom, so I'm just gonna keep getting bigger. I think my next creation will be uh, something that I can wear for the winter. Mm. Um. Well, I have a lot of unfinished baskets in my house and <laughs> they kind of pile up and I'm excited to finish those this, hopefully this month. Um, but for like a really, really big project, um, I'm not really sure. There's definitely thousands of them. Um, yeah. A little kid's Willow Playhouse would be really cool soon. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have a question for you both. So what's like something that you, like what's something that you learned uh, or realized like during your time um, in the residency that like you're gonna carry with you like going forward, like in terms of your artistic practice? Everything, cause this was, uh brand new experience for me everything about it was new for me like the project that I did um I didn't go to art school so I even writing an artist proposal was something that I had to like look up and figure out how to do so pretty much everything about this experience I'm just gonna use it for my next my next project or my next opportunity Yeah, I agree with that. So many different things. Like there were so many new things I had never done in my own practice, but also like giving me the opportunity to really focus on presenting online. Like I'd never done that before. I'd never made a slideshow. I've never compiled photos of my art um, besides just little Instagram posts. So, so that's been a huge gift. And yeah, so thankful for you, Sydney. Oh my gosh, we have questions, questions. Okay, from Solange, I hope I'm saying that right. I follow you on Instagram, Solange, but okay. How did you get started doing this kind of work and what are you currently inspired by? This 
is for both of you to answer. Uh, I got started because I always wanted to weave, but I just, I felt like I couldn't afford to buy a loom. I felt like I couldn't afford to buy the material. And then one day I just decided to do it. I don't know. I don't, I can't remember why, but I just decided to buy it and then to get the, the yarn and that's how I started. But I've always wanted to learn how to weave. And what was the second part of the question? There was another part. Yeah, what are you currently inspired by? Um, currently inspired by doing more um, natural dyeing and trying to learn um, how to use some material and some dyes that my own ancestors have used. So definitely the, the Koshinia, I'm definitely inspired to use that a lot more. Um, Solange, a little shout out to you. Your artwork is amazing. Um, and uh, um, what's the question? Oh yeah. I, I remember just for the first basket I wove, I remember um, just being invited to go over to a friend's house when I was younger and um, didn't have a car. Was living in Vermont in the middle of the forest, hitchhiked up this road to a friend's house and we went to the backyard and harvested some um, dogwood and they showed me how to weave a basket. And um, I remember just after that, just like immediately like the next time I was free, I just sat in the riverbed in the snow weaving and did that over and over again, just with the little bit I knew I just loved it immediately. Um, and then what I'm most inspired by, um, I really like goats a lot. Um, <laughs> um, but in artist forms, like, I don't know. Um, yeah. Just learning more, just expanding my skills, I think, from my knowledge. Let's see, we have one question for Sespi from Daniel. Um, Daniel says, I imagine you have developed long-term relationship relationships with willow plants that you have returned to over many years. Have you noticed the plant responding to your tending in any unique ways? Any notable personality changes in the plants due to your presence? Thank you both for sharing your beautiful gifts. Hi, Daniel. Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, six years is some spots I've been going to. Um, and I noticed that there's, of course, like, as I think we're, a lot of us are aware of, there's a lot of changes in our environment right now. And um, and you definitely see that year from year from year changing constantly. Um, and I see plants that get cut back and tended um, thriving in a lot of places. Though I also see um, it's site specific on how much water there is. And a lot of times they need resting times too, um, when there isn't that much water. And I really want to, I really want to do a study, a personal study, or maybe like, a, I don't know if you college study, college fund study about like, about that and see like if I, because I feel like it's true that willow that is grown and coppiced produces more flowers, more leaves, more opportunities for insect life. And I'm super curious to do like, yeah, some, some more, more note taking around that. So if you ever got, if got anything on that, let me know. Okay. 
Okay, so we have a few more questions from Solange. These will be the last questions for this artist talk. Um, Solange um, says, weaving is usually associ associated with storytelling. Do you feel like your work tells any specific stories? Also, what do you want people to take away when they see or experience your work? This is for both of you. So the earrings that I made in the past with the seed pods, like it does, it does have a, a story to them and, and um, it's a conversation starter. So people ask, oh, what's that seed or where does it come from? And I think with these earrings that I've been working on, that will also be kind of a conversation starter of like, what is a natural insulator or all those pieces were dyed with natural, with uh, plants from the area. So I think, um, I guess with the project that I worked on during the residency, when I do end up selling or giving these earrings away, I think they will end up being kind of like a, a conversation starter, maybe to slow fashion or um, handmade, handmade functional things. Um, I love thinking about stories in that way of, of weaving. I feel like it's such a story of, of, of people, of culture, of people's, people's movements across the landscape. Um, and also like there's just so many stories I felt like I, I feel like I wanted to tell or want to tell in, in that small amount of time, like beaver stories and stories of like finding amazing uh, like beaver dams and like just the, the stories of the day, the simple stories of what happens on the landscape when you're out on the land, you know, hanging out with the plants and the animals. Um, and oh skeleton woman i've been thinking about that forever like skeleton woman life death life cycle that's an amazing story um that's in women who run with wolves i think it, it is it's like yeah i really love that story a lot um and then um what was the other question about was there a second part um, what do you want people to take away when they see or experience your work? Oh my gosh, I want people to be inspired to learn more things about the plants around them and also pick up some natural materials and make something beautiful out of them, whatever it is. Awesome. Thank you so much to the audience for all these wonderful questions for our artists. Um, this, this is it. This is the end. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank you all um, again for tuning in to this artist talk and um, big, big special thanks to um, Sespi and Becca for sharing their expertise and, um, and their projects with us today. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.